and we also have um, so the large scale SIG is described uh, at this URL um, on the wiki. Uh, it's basically a group of uh, operators of medium to large scale or to very, very large scale OpenStack deployments. Um, they, we are trying to facilitate moving from the initial like scaling that you do like from uh, tens of nodes to hundreds of nodes to the next level. Uh, how do you get past that hundreds of nodes to thousands of nodes? Um, and and how do we document that so that it's easier for uh, and less scary for for operators to go from those initial uh, tens of nodes to hundreds and thousands of nodes? And especially uh, we have three work streams. Um, one is around moving the limits for scaling within one cluster. Um, so as you add nodes to a single cluster, uh, something will start failing over at some point. Uh, and the question is when and uh, what will fail first and what can we do to push back those limits, document them and push, push them back. Um, the second work stream is around documenting large scale operations. Uh, sometimes our documentation is around um, like uh, default values that make sense for all-in-ones or small deployments, but that are not suited to uh, deployment at a larger scale. So identifying which configuration options you should tweak and um, and uh, what type of values you need to you need to work on is is the goal of this second work stream. And here, then we also need uh, a lot of input from uh, the experience of other operators because it's difficult to come up with good values at scale if you're just uh, talking from one standpoint. And finally, the last and more recent uh, work stream for the SIG is around meaningful monitoring. How do we get to the point where uh, we have, oops, sorry, um, where we have uh, uh, good information, uh, actionable information that is being brought back from the system uh, to the operator so that we, we identify those scaling issues really early on. Um, so this session is around collecting stories that your experience as you added more nodes, what happened, what failed first, uh, what did you have to, to um, to tweak to get to the next level and at which point you had to basically scale out to multiple clusters because that was the only way to, to scale at, at, at a larger scale. And as we collect those stories, we will we hopefully will see some common patterns, some common things that are likely to fail first. Is it like RabbitMQ, is it Neutron? Uh, and and what, what did you do to, to, to push that back? And we can document that uh, if we have enough stories. So to kick things, and uh, this is an open session, like if you want to join in and, and participate, please do, because the goal is to really collect, uh, collect the input from new people that are not part of the SIG yet, uh, rather than uh, just uh, tag on the, the existing SIG members. But to kick off the discussion and try to set the, the tone, uh, I'll Turn to uh, Arnaud first at OVH. Uh, can give us some uh, insight on their experience as they, they in the very early stages of scaling a single cluster. What what ended up failing first, and what did they do about it? Yeah, thank you, uh, Thierry. Um, yeah, at OVH, um, we deployed um, OpenStack since uh, years now, and uh, what fir first failed is uh, Neutron. On our side, it's uh, always Neutron. Why Neutron? Because um, perhaps because we are using a custom driver. We are not using a pure uh, Open vSwitch upstream driver. We are using our custom driver, but I'm pretty sure that it's also, also affecting Open vSwitch uh, driver. Um, what is the effect is, uh, for example, when we uh, decide to restart every uh, agent, every neutron agent uh, on the infra, 
uh, it will overload a lot Natron server. And uh, if we scale enough Natron server, it will be correct, but then it will overload uh, database. And uh, if it's not database, it will overload Nova, etc. So it's always because of Natron agents uh, at the end. So what we do uh, to avoid that, First, we monitor very carefully number of ports in build because we 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 saw a relation between number of ports in build uh, in the database and uh, load on Neutron side. So it means if we have a lot of ports in build status, then we will for sure have a load, a very high load on Neutron server. Um, we also monitor load on Neutron server itself and databases. Uh, not that. Um, at OVH, we used to deploy only one uh, MySQL Galera cluster for all OpenStack services, for Nova and Neutron. Uh, so that's maybe one point which could be improved on our side in order to reduce the load for uh, by splitting Galera clusters, simply. Uh, but it's not very easy to do um, when you are running live. I mean, in production, you have to take care of um, how to move from uh, one big cluster to separated clusters. It's not easy. So if you have a choice, uh, it's, it may be a good idea to separate uh, databases uh, at the beginning. Um, we usually don't go over 1,000 uh, nodes per region. Uh, because of this, because of neutron uh, scaling issues. And uh, what can I say more? Yeah, usually when we uh, have, for the biggest region we have, we usually try to have bigger um, computes for databases and also have a more lot of uh, RPC workers for neutron uh, in order to, you know, uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, avoid this overloading. Um, there is one thing that uh, I can say also is when it's going bad, I mean, when we restart every agent and if it's um, uh, overloading neutron, it will never uh, be able to, um, to be up again correctly because most of the time neutron agent is asking uh, uh, neutron server informations it's thinking basically but it's uh, waiting for um, rpc timeout which is by default i think 60 seconds so we increase that to uh, five minutes or something like that but even even after five minutes sometimes neutron server is not able to answer correctly to the agent and when agent did did not if an agent do not receive correct answers it will start over so it means every time it's starting over and over and it's keeping a uh, neutron server uh, overloaded and we never end up in being in this situation is kind of uh, a nightmare so what we do usually is we stop uh, most of the neutron agents and we start them very slowly in order to uh, make sure that neutron load will not uh, uh, go above one threshold that we decided and uh, being, able, being able to answer in the correct time slot uh, to neutron agents. Um, and what we, so based on the fact that we decided to not go over 1K nodes, we scale out by multiplying number of regions which is good because we split control planes for every region. So if one region is down, it's not affecting others, but it's bad because uh, it, it, it in, in imply a lot of regions to manage. And uh, it's also complicated for customers to understand that they are on the first region and not on the second one, but these, these regions are the same. So it's, uh, it's quite difficult for them to manage uh, all of this. So, yeah, uh, I think I said yeah. everything. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you. And we'll see if that hits also uh, a nerve at other operators. If they have, if you had the same type of issues as Arno at OVH, uh, uh, please mention it when, when, uh, when it's your turn. Um, maybe we can switch to Bill Miro at CERN. 
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. OK. I'm in the office. I need to wear a mask. Sorry about that. Um, so our deployment, um, can you hear me, really? Uh, yes. Yeah, we're good. Awesome. Uh, I had a question for Arn also. Should I wait for the end, or can I ask it now? Uh, no, please ask it now. Okay, so I, uh, we did run into exactly the same issue with the RPC worker thread and we had to increase the count. Uh, but the question I had was when we encountered this problem, uh, we saw that the RabbitMQ was getting really choked. It was continuously trying to close the connection. So my question is, uh, did you have to tune RabbitMQ in any way or uh, was the only change uh, that you had to do was around RPC timeout and RPC worker thread count, et cetera, or was it anything around RabbitMQ? Yeah, yeah we did also some very uh, basic tuning on RabbitMQ side. Um, we did that at the beginning when we deployed our first OpenStack region. Uh, but we, we also had issue on Rabbit because, but not because of OpenStack itself, but I think because of Rabbit uh, bugs. We had some Rabbit issues because of uh, old uh, version of Rabbit. Uh, by upgrading Rabbit to the latest version, we, we managed to have something which is correctly working. So, the, the, the thing about Rabbit is that usually uh, in, in the team, nobody is. Um, an expert on Rabbit side. So uh, it's usually hard to debug because we are not used to manage Rabbit MQs. And when it works, it's, it's, it's amazing. But when something is broken in Rabbit, it, you are kind of uh, lost in uh, what should I do? Or what is the starting point of debugging a Rabbit uh, cluster? So um, years after years, we um, built some documentation on the we now we are now able to um, completely manage RabbitMQ uh, based on the documentation we we have internally and uh, based on the tuning we did. But nothing fancy, just uh, you know, kernel TCP tuning or um, very basic uh, RabbitMQ uh, settings. And uh, yeah, we did us, uh, also one thing. Um, if you check um, there is a thread a recent thread uh, on mailing list about RabbitMQ tuning the RabbitMQ policy for example and uh, HA how do you enable HF only for some of the queues and stuff like that so we applied that on our side and uh, for now it's working quite correctly okay yeah thanks yeah sorry about that Bermiro can you start again no it's fine <laughs> Um, so CERN, we started our deployment um, around eight years ago that we started playing with OpenStack. Um, and from the beginning that we believe that having everything in one cluster will not be enough for us because we wanted to move all our nodes into OpenStack. So we started from the beginning exploring Nova cells, initially only two cells, very big cells, uh, more than 1000 nodes that we add per cell. But early on that we observed that this was not a very good idea to have so many nodes in <clears throat> these two different clusters, the, these two cells. Um, we've been learning over time. Initially also we had the RO control plane running on physical nodes. Everything was clustered, uh, everything was replicated. So what we've been doing and learning over time is that um, at least for our use case, we don't need all of this. We move the control plane to run on virtual machines. Uh, we don't have a central database for all the services. For, for each service, we have a different database server for that database. For example, we have a database server for Nova for each cell. Each cell has its own database server. Um, because this allows us to, to have the different databases in different places would give us some redundancy, at least per cell. Um, and also this happens for all the other services like Aronic, Cinder, Keystone. Um, so clusters on the control plane, we don't use them. Um, we only have one rabbit MQ per cell. The only thing that is clustered is the Nova top um, controller. 
for cell zero? Because it's the, basically the bottleneck for all the messages from all the cells. Only that one is clustering over. For the other services, for example, we have a rabbit cluster for Neutron because the amount of messages, basically that is to spread the load between the different nodes in the rabbit MQ. But smaller services um, like Cinder, um, ironic, they don't need rabbit MQ at all. Even if at the beginning and even recently, we have been running them. Um, so what I mentioned here, so yeah, we have been, instead of trying to, these big clusters to work, we are trying to have a lot of them, having a lot of cells, but with very small number of nodes. So currently per cell, we have around 200 compute nodes. Uh, and that for connecting to database and Rabbit, um, we don't observe any, any issue. The issue that we observed when we start introducing Neutron into the infrastructure, uh, because we started with Nova Network a long time ago, was that we cannot add this logic uh, of Nova cells into Neutron. So exactly the same issues that uh, OVH uh, sees, we start seeing them. Um, initially, we had only one region, so more than 8,000 compute nodes um, in one region, and since we are we are moving them into Neutron, uh, reaching 3,000, 4,000 compute nodes, we're starting seeing problems with Neutron. So at that moment, what we decided to do was basically to split infrastructure into regions, basically what OVH has. Um, in this case, to scale Neutron, um, because in that case, we have one Neutron instance per region. So now we have cells on top of cells and we have regions. Currently we have three regions and these three regions, the neutron in those regions manages around 3000 compute nodes. Also maybe our use case is a little bit different because we use a very simple uh, neutron driver that is the Linux bridge. Even though it's very chatty as all the others, and the main issue that we observe in Rabbit is not really on the server side, on the on Neutron, it's not really the server side, but the Rabbit MQ. So when we have any issue with the Rabbit cluster, it's um, it's an operations nightmare. Um, especially when we have some kind of uh, power cut in one cell and all of them connect at the same time, uh, we have message overflow on Rabbit and that is very difficult to handle. So, um... Sorry, Belmiro. So if I summarize correctly, you basically had the same type of issues with um, Neutron and RabbitMQ being the reason why you pushed to aggressively using regions as a way to, to scale further. Is that accurate? Uh, for Neutron, yes. So is, okay. the only way to escape this is to have multiple Neutron installations. And for that, you need regions. Um, for other services, like small services like LAN, Cinder, we don't have, uh, we deploy only, we only have one deployment that we use in all regions. We don't separate them. Um, so I, I think we have a common pattern here, um, being Neutron, um, probably the most difficult project to scale currently. In terms of bare metal, um, we are trying to move all our nodes into Ironic. Initially, because there is, if you are using cells, there is no different way to do it. We needed to have all the nodes in one cell. Um, so we were observing some very, very, um, it was extremely slow to communicate with this, um, with Ironic and to actually do operations in Ironic because of this. So we moved to conductor groups um, and we apply that into Nova and Ironic. Um, we will have a presentation today about this. Also, we also wrote a blog post where we have more information. I think about the elephant in the room that is Rabbit and Neutron. Um, initially, we are playing with the different configuration options that we can have in Rabbit. We also gave a presentation two years ago in Vancouver about this. I put the, the video in the, in the header pad if you're interested about all the configuration that we are currently using. 
for driving to you and your turn. Thank you. Is there any quick question for uh, Bill Miro before we move to the next one? I have a small question. Have you ever seen any issues with uh, Cinder um, as well with like a high amount of volumes being created and quotas deadlocking uh, when provisioning new volumes? Uh, I don't remember seeing any issue with Cinder. Arne is connected. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he wants to comment. But for Cinder, I don't remember this particular kind of issue. What we had, we had issues when deleting volumes. So this is why we introduced into Cinder the trash functionality where we basically do a quick deletion and only mark it for a deletion. And we have something in the background that cleans it up. So deletion was more of an issue creation. I don't think we have ever yeah. seen this. And we use this trash functionality, which is based on the Ceph trash functionality in, in production since, I don't know, two or three years. So it's working really well. And this allows basically to delete a volume right away, also a big volume, basically within a second or so. The quota is, is giving back to the user and the user can create a new volume while the deletion is happening in the background. So the user doesn't have to wait for, um, for the deletion to get the quota back. Cool, sounds good, thank you. Okay, uh, let's quickly move on to IBM scaling story. I don't know who put that in. Is it you, Divya? Anyone for the IBM scaling story? Uh, hi, sorry, I, I I did not hear that. I'm sorry about that. Yes, so. Um, well, uh, we've been hitting multiple issues. Uh, so for example, the first set of issues that we hit was the neutron, which is already covered. Um, along with the neutron, we hit uh, the second set of issues where uh, RabbitMQ related. So we did some tuning parameter changes. Uh, specifically, we added the backlog. Um, we increased the backlog and the timeouts in, so backlog in RabbitMQ uh, and the timeout in the different OpenStack configuration file along with RPC worker thread and timeout, et cetera. So that kind of stabilized the, uh, the neutron situation, but that was with uh, OpenStack Stein that we hit it first. So the thing is we've been using OpenStack for quite some time and it is with Stein that we first hit this issue, even though the number of nodes, so our customers, they keep using it. And when they upgrade, we, we see that they, they don't have issues with say Queen, but they hit the issue as soon as they upgrade to the Stein. And then um, now that we're hitting, uh, we are testing with Usuri. So we test with uh, 100 concurrent tests and, uh, and move ahead with that. So we see a lot of issues with Keystone. Uh, so apart from the Neutron issue and the RabbitMQ, the next set before even we move to Keystone is with MariaDB. So when we go ahead with the concurrent test, we we often run into databases locked kind of issue. This happens typically with around 100 concurrent tests or so. So uh, that's when we went back and started looking at MariaDB documentation and updating few values in uh, there are, there are, there's a lot of documentation on tuning parameters. So we tried that and then it seems to be working. But with Usuri, uh, there have been a lot of uh, problems with Keystone. Uh, every other time we run into Keystone is temporary, temporarily um, uh, unavailable uh, kind of error. And uh, so Keystone internally is configured with memcache. So we often run into memcache socket timeout issue. So for that, um, what we tried was, uh, I think the in, in, in memcache configuration file, there's a cache value which was increased after which we didn't see that issue. Uh, but then uh, again, we run into Keystone issue. In, so we have Keystone running in HTTP uh, web server uh, with a default value, which is basically process with, with a single process. And with all these releases, we have not hit issue with that, but then, uh, we, with Usuri, we tried increasing it uh, to 25, and then now we are running with 50 uh, with four, five, 400 concurrent uh, VM deploys. Uh, and once we increased Keystone processes to 50, then we saw that we started hitting MariaDB, DB logged issue again, or um, then again, we had to go back and fix MariaDB. So it seems to be like a cycle that you change a value at some, some layer, it, 
it, it uh, starts showing up at the next layer. So everything has to be increased. So it, similarly, we also had uh, a lot of issues with the open file limit, not limited to a particular service. Uh, we see it uh, right in RabbitMQ, NOAA, et cetera. And then we, we have to go and change the open file limit at different different levels, right? From system CTL to the actual service file and um, so, so various various levels so that it actually reflects. Uh, yeah, and so, so these are the high level uh, problems. So primarily a lot of problems we, we hit with RapidMQ and now with MariaDB and uh, specifically in Usuri with uh, Keystone. And uh, I, I don't even want to go into things like Noki, et cetera, which is, I believe, I, I'm not sure how many uh, how many deploys are currently using Noki, but we see a lot of performance issue with that as well. Okay, uh, any quick question for Divya? If not, we'll move to uh, Line. Do we have anyone from Line to present their scaling story? Uh, yeah, I will. Hey, Jean. Yeah, um, yeah. So basically, uh, what we found out is like any of this type API calls time um, will gradually become slow because kind of like when you scale out, you will have um, more users and more servers. So it's kind of a small issue for when you scale out. And the second thing we find out is that um, Nova's Rapid Clean clusters on Lake packets becomes uh, larger and larger. When you scale up, if you didn't change um, the number of uh, control plane nodes or workers for Nova conductor, as um, you normally will notice, it's because it, it didn't hit the performance uh, in API's response uh, in a very noticeable way. Yeah, and for uh, most of the rapid and include clusters issue, we're currently using uh, Oslo metrics to mon mon uh, monitor RPC calls issues. and um, there will be a talk uh, by my colleague, uh, Radeep Sun and Motum Sun today, later today. So if you are interested in it, um, please check it out. And I'm currently working on two upstream um, this part. And another issue that we found out happened very frequently is that uh, scheduling batch instance creations becomes uh, very slow and timeouts. So, uh, we just observe these issues when scheduling around uh, 150 instances uh, to around uh, 1,300 hypervisors. So the API will time out uh, before the instance is actually finished scheduling. So we make a small tweak inside our scheduler to uh, kind of increase some of the performance to temporarily solve this issue. And uh, the last part is um, kind of to be aware of database setting like uh, max full size or max overflow uh, as we're getting um, kind of some complaints from um, our DBA teams about uh, too many connections uh, when, as we scale out. Uh, yeah, um, we did some, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, just like uh, Divya San said uh, regarding the IBM scaling story, we also had actually some issues regarding the open file connections uh, with the Neutron server. So due to multiple uh, compute nodes connecting with the uh, with limited Neutron servers, we experienced that the number of connections which uh, the sockets were making increased dramatically, and uh, we did uh, face some ex uh, problems with the uh, number of open files. Okay, um, thank you all. Um, any questions for Radeep or Jean? If not, we'll move on to Stack HPC story. I think it's uh, John. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, so this is maybe a slightly different story. It's quite a point scaling exercise so there's a i'm going to present on this later in the week um but the kind of crux of it was there's a big slurm cluster well biggish slurm cluster it's about 1200 nodes and the, re and the ask really was how do we quickly re-image all of these as, um, as quickly as possible so rather than the number of nodes being active it's really how quickly can we rebuild them all um 
So this was built using Colorant Spawn KOB, just using all the defaults to start with and then seeing how it, see what broke. I suppose to start on one side, there's the networking. So with um, Ironic, we're using multi-tenant networking. So we wanted to re, um, reconfigure the switches. We started, they were cumulus switches, um, Melox cumulus switches. To start with, we were using Ansible networking, but it was just proving a bit slow. Um, we moved to networking generic switch, which was better. So it moved from sort of several minutes to reconfig. Well, we got it down to about 300 seconds to reconfigure the whole switch, which is still pretty slow. Um, and in the end, I had a look at batching up the commands to the switch inside NGS that patches up for review. Well, it's, it's in draft up for review, but that really sped things up. So then the networking wasn't so much of an issue. Um, eventually we were able to end up hitting limits in ironic conductor. We were only running three ironic conductors for this particular test. Um, really just wanted to see how far that the three could go. Um, and there's single process, but with tuning, um, effectively, I ended up finding out that the HA proxy logs were particularly interesting when you understood the crazy format. Um, so if you go read the docs on the HA proxy logs, it turns out we we're actually hitting connection timeout limits. So um, basically, it's the amount of time it takes, as I understand it, from uh, starting the connection, opening the socket, to actually the client completing the connection. And Ironic Conductor was struggling with this when it was under heavy load. I think simply because eventlet-wise, it was just busy doing other things after the socket was opened, and then he eventually got back to try and write the rest of the request, at which point sometimes HA Proxy or, or MariaDB had decided to kill the connection. So with finding out that seam of interesting timeouts I'd never discovered before, um, that got around that problem. Um, I guess there's some interesting bits and pieces about moving to the direct deploy driver rather than um, the iSCSI driver, although uh, the Ironic community removing the iSCSI driver is going to remove that problem for many people because the decision's not there, <laughs> which is all good. Um, historically, we were just using the iSCSI driver, but direct with HTTP seemed to work really well. Um, forcing raw images is on by default by turning that off it made quite a big difference for this particular use case um because the qcow image was much smaller than the raw image so instead of transferring the raw image to all of the computes just transferring the um, qcow image saved quite a lot of network bandwidth so that certainly helped um there were some issues that yeah, the julius commented on um, but that was the dominant reason for that change uh, I guess, yeah, in the ironic cache, once the image was in the cache, that seemed to work really well with the direct deploy. Um, so yeah, it, was, it wasn't too many tweaks, although uh, learning the HA proxy log format, I'd recommend if you start seeing timeouts, because um, that was really enlightening. Uh, we've got Prometheus logging on, which told us like what was happening to a certain extent with Node Exporter and C Advisor, just all standard colorensible stuff, but um, I think that was the breakthrough moment for me. Um, yeah, open to questions. Okay. Any quick question for John? Is there is there anything you, and it's like a, a general question, um, is there anything you wish you had known before? Um, like, be, you know, kind of a revelation that, that you wish you had known before you started that that scaling journey and that you now know, and it's pretty obvious, but it's. I suppose the first thing I, I'd say that I was glad I knew is that people like CERN and others were running Ironic at a larger scale than I was trying to. So I figured that there was a success at the end of the journey. Um, so that gave me confidence to keep plugging along. And I'd say that was kind of used very, very useful. <laughs> um, I suppose I should say I also made a bit of use of the guru mediation stuff, uh, GMR. Ironic's got really nice docs on that for what it's worth. That tells you what all the event threads are happening in the process, which is sort of interesting. Um, although in reality, once I read the logs, the logs actually told me what was happening. Um, but yeah, knowing that other people have trodden before this, um, I did also have a chat with Arne about some of these problems as we hit them. 
which is probably when I discovered we were doing more, I don't know, we were doing more image builds than I think you were probably trying to do at one time, but even so, it was good to have that. Um, I'll enlarge the question to everyone that has talked. Is there anything you, you wish you had known before, uh, before starting or is there like a, a pro tip that, that like you can communicate to the rest of the group? And otherwise, is there anyone else that has a story to share? Or like 53 people in the in the room. I bet there are other OpenStack operators that can you don't have like to put anything in the Etherpad, just just speak up. <laughs> Um, I can just chime in on some Neutron stuff. We occasionally, I don't know if a lot of people have this use case, but we have the use case of a lot of VMs going up in parallel together. Um, and we see a lot of issues, like for example, uh, with Neutron um, being unable to allocate IPs because it ends up being in some weird deadlock because of so many ports going up at once inside the same subnet. Um, we're talking about like potentially like 200 to 300 ports being created in parallel. Um, it could be some like weird thing that uh, we're running into. Um, I tried to investigate a little bit and some of the code that um, handles retries and things like that. Um, it's like, it seems like Neutron has its own retries code for deadlocks, not using the one provided by Oslo DB. That seems to be a historical thing. And so I think part of why it's not handling it greatly is that I pushed up a, like a POC patch, but I never got around pushing that through. But I don't know if anybody else has any similar stories. I did see that as well, actually, when I was doing this rebuild work, because um, you obviously you create the provisioning ports at the same time. Mm -hmm. But there's only that was only a, a hundred or so ports at a time because we were throttling it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely a I'd be interested to see what happens. For for what it's worth, the way I worked around it was horrendous. Um, I increased the size of the subnet because it was a slash sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> or the, or the I increased the allocation pool. Yeah. So Which, that was something I ran into. Okay, um, so we have five minutes left. And since the next session is starting just in, in five minutes, we'll try to end early. Um, I wanted to point to uh, next steps. Um, so we'll have a meeting during the PTG next week uh, for the large scale SIG. So if, you, um, if you're interested in helping with the goals that I uh, explained earlier, so uh, um, for those who just joined, uh, scaling within one cluster, which is why we're collecting those, uh, those uh, scaling stories, documenting large scale operations, basically having a book for configuration values that make sense um, uh, at, at larger scale, uh, and also uh, start to think about how we can improve meaningful monitoring. Because one of the constants in all those stories is, is that it's not always obvious to um, which parameter uh, to watch for, for early failures. And so having kind of a actionable, simpler uh, monitoring rather than a wealth of, of things to watch uh, trying to narrow it down to, to the golden signals that we should track uh, and how we can improve on that. All that to facilitate uh, getting to a larger scale for our users. Um, so if you're interested in helping with those, uh, I encourage you to uh, come and uh, join us at the PTG next week. We have two sessions on Wednesday, uh, one at 7 UTC. Uh, essentially for uh, Asia Pacific time zone and Europe time zone um, to, to discuss and one at 16 UTC. Uh, so that one is more uh, Europe and US friendly. 
So wherever you're located, uh, you should find a time that actually works for you. And uh, I encourage you to join us there and we'll continue the discussion that we started today uh, there. Um, so um, uh, please come and we'll have uh, regular SIG meetings that will resume in November once the, the PTG and summit uh, meetings are over. Um, so we'll, that, that will be the next step. And I, and I put a few links to the etherpad if you're interested in, in uh, seeing where, where to go next. So please um, uh, come next week at the, at the PTG um, if you're interested in helping with the large scale SIG or if you have a story to tell um, and, and uh, we'll continue the discussion there. Any uh, other last minute mention? Hey, Terry. Hey there, I, I just have like uh, one last minute questions. Uh, I was just wondering, is there anyone in large scale using the Keystone Federation uh, in uh, like in multi-region area? And is it like uh, good or is it cause any problems? Can anyone? Using what? Can you uh, the Keystone Federation. Keystone Federated Federation. Keystone, yes. Mm. Um, not at OVH. Okay. I think CERN is using it, right? Uh, not, not for the regions. So we just have the normal region on Keystone. Okay. Okay. But uh, so if anyone using it, uh, I'm going to leave some messaging in the Etherpad. So if anyone have anything to uh, comment or feedback, uh, please help us. <laughs> We're just trying to figure out if there's good things. Yeah, I, I have been using it, but not at massive scale. The Federation, uh, Keystone mm -hmm. Federation, that is. Yeah. Um, I, I just got concerns. Maybe, maybe there will be like uh, one lines facing the uh, large scale user performance issue, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something. I don't. I don't have the large scale to to uh, to actually testing out. So, well, thanks. Okay. Uh, so that concludes our session. Uh, there are two forum sessions starting in one minute. One on the uh, open stack client feature gap, and the other on operational concerns on Manila. So uh, please join there if you're interested in discussing those. And I'll see you around um, because I'll join one of those. Thanks everyone for sharing and I uh, hope I see a lot of you at the PTG next week. Okay, see you. Bye-bye.